Yeah, hello everyone, welcome back. So now I'm so excited. Now I'm going to start the second talk of today's symposium. So before we start, I would like to thank you, Dr. Aminata Gabra, to be the moderator for the session. Dr. Aminata, do you want to say hi now? Are you there? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Good morning. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session. Uh, so we will be getting started uh, very soon without uh, a delay. And today we have uh, four presentations. And I will just like uh, to invite the speakers maybe to put their camera on so that we can see them and uh, have uh, maybe a quick introduction and we will start with the presentation. Can you maybe switch your camera on, please? Thank you. I can see only one. Hi, Bruno. Hello. Yeah, and also I can see Miss Wu from Chinese Academy of Sciences. And then, uh, so let's go get started because mm -hmm. Mr. Hu will be the first presenter anyway. So let's start with Mr. Hu. Could you please introduce yourself uh, and then have the presentation? You have up to 15 minutes maximum for your presentation. Uh, if you finish early, we will have maybe one or two questions. Otherwise, we'll get the questions at the end of all four presentations. So uh, Mr. Hu, please go ahead. Um, and then for your presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Xiaoyan Hu from National Space Science Data Center of China. And um, I'm sorry that uh, I have a little bit of code. And so I might not be able to speak very clearly. Please let me know if I'm unclear on anything. And uh, um, or I can, I can type in the chat box and thank you. Mm, the this uh, report was done in uh, co uh, collaboration with the Computer Network Information Center and Chinese Academy of Science. I hope that my report will give you an initial insight into the roles of PIDs in scientific data management in China. Okay, and the fair principles describe the um, characteristics intended to support access and the reuse of digital artifacts in the scientific research eco uh, ecosystem. Uh, and as we know, um, the digital ob objects and the persistent identifiers are the core to the idea of fair data. And some studies has concluded that the PIDs play an important role in the F element of FAIR, and uh, namely the find findability and uh, all the other uh, FAIR principles, A, I, and R, are based upon it. And the PIDs can work in many uh, specific ways, such as in data, uh, sorry, uh, such as data publication, data citation, author tracking, and the uh, published result tracking, and so on. And um, as a result, uh, now uh, the data organizations and the institutions in China are increasing aware of PIDs uh, as, as required for the implement of the FAIR principles. And as a result, many good practices have been developed. Um, now I will show the most commonly used PIDs in China. Um, in Chinese data uh, response, uh, repositories and the research communities, uh, the most commonly used PIDs are DOI, the ORCID, and the other general identifiers, and some uh, domain-oriented uh, identifiers. And DOI is a well-known digital identifier for objects of any type. And uh, uh, more fam familiar to the researchers, DOIs are wi widely used in academ uh, academic um, publication and uh, data publication, and there are two uh, re 
registration agencies in China, uh, namely the China uh, National Knowledge Infrastructure infrastructure, uh, CNKI, and the Institute of uh, Scientific and Technical Information of China and One Fund Data. And uh, some uh, famous global um, platforms such as DataSite are based on DOI for data, uh, for data restoration and the discovery too. And the ORCID is the um, persistent digital identifier that uh, distinguished one researcher from other researchers and uh, the records that support the links among all his activities and the ORCIDs are currently used to record and uh, to identify the uh, specific individuals of data producers uh, and the data users and so on and uh, enabling the um, check of data users, uh, usage. And there are also some um, domain-oriented PIDs such as SPACE. Uh, SPACE is about uh, space physics data. And the o, uh, IVOID, it is about uh, astronomy data. And the ATCC, it is about strings. And uh, the metadata of the um, domain-oriented identifiers often prefer greater um, gradulatory and uh, richness. And these identifiers and uh, the metadata not only support the data fi findability and accessibility. And for example, uh, the metadata uh, harvesting, and, but also the um, domain-specific demands for the data understanding and the data uh, interoperability, uh, <laughs> sorry. Mm. So it is worth noting that China has also as, uh, established a, a persistent identifier, namely the China Science and Technology um, Resource Identifier or uh, CSTR for short. And the CSTR is um, proposed by the Ministry of Science and Technology of China um, for the identification, the um, cataloging, and uh, the restoration, the publication, and the ma maintenance and the management of the um, scientific and the technology resources in China. And a national uh, standard had also been established for this purpose. And in this standard, there are more than 20 types of um, science and technology um, resources have been covered, in, uh, including the, uh, uh, the large scale scientific equipment, the major science and technology infrastructures, and the research and uh, experimental basis and uh, in some gen uh, genetic resources and uh, the materials, the spe uh, specimen and uh, uh, the scientific data and uh, reports, the papers, the books and the standards and uh, the softwares and so on. Um, so the so the kernel information needed by CSTR is shown on the left and the um, com component of the STL number is shown on the right and the, um, the CSTR number is uh, consists of a uniform um, prefix and a re uh, re <laughs> sorry uh, registration authority code and a uh, science and technology resource type code and a uh, suffix. And the um, uniform prefix is CSTR and a uh, clone. And the um, registration authority code is a code indicating the res uh, who, who issued the ESTR. Um, for example, National Space Science State Center is uh, the number is one four eight zero four, and the Science and Technology Resource Type Code um, ident 
identify the 23 um, types of science and technology resources mentioned in uh, pre um, precious, uh, uh, previous page. Um, and the suffix is assigned by the um, re registration authority uh, using a com combination of letters, uh, numbers, and uh, um, um, the limit. Uh, and uh, sorry. Um, for example, um, here are two um, HTTP URLs of the CSTRs uh, like this. And the first one is a database called Chang'e 2 Global uh, Digital um, Auto Photo Model with, um, fi with 50 meter uh, resolution. And it is detected by China's Lunar Exploration Project. And the second one is uh, digital information about a plant seed. And it is uh, registered by Kunming Insti Institute of Botany. And uh, several um, official um, um, de designated CSTR responsible um, authorities are responsible for the approval and uh, management of the um, authorities and the to um, as to, to building the uh, core systems and one important of them is the chief center of the scientific data center network um, it has developed and operated a PID infra infrastructure called data PID um, there are three types of um, scientific data centers in Chinese Academy of Sciences and the chief center, the discipline center, and the institution data center. The chief center is a um, journalist um, uh, repository and a technical repository service providers. Uh, the responsibility of it is to, um, is the uh, uh, scientific data resource archiving and to uh, the operation and the maintenance of the scientific big data sharing um, service platforms and to um, provide general and technical service for the scientific data management and open sharings. Okay, so let's introduce the uh, data PID. Data PID is one of the basic information and infrastructure of the um, data pro uh, processing manage and the fair data. Um, the aim of it is to um, provide identification service for use in data publish, data reuse, data link, and so on. Um, and it it provides uh, a series of uh, services um, such as support uh, and both handle and CSTR um, registration and to support the PID resolution and uh, support the hierarchical management of PID and to support self-defined self metadata and uh, management and to support uh, API online form, um, chime, uh, XML and JSON document upload and to uh, support PID um, numbering schema. And there are two types of users uh, in data PID, the data provider and the data user. Uh, data provider is a member of the data PID who uh, operate a uh, data-related platform, um, for example, data publish platform or data, manage, data management platform and so on, and to apply and uh, uh, registry PID for the objects such as data set, file, and the software, the workflow, the uh, instrument, and so on and as well as to edit the surface such as the statistic and the link with the paper and so on. And the, uh, the data user uh, can require the data to cite the data uh, with the standard form and to download the uh, data and so on. 
uh, until now there are uh, 15 data centers um, join the data uh, PID and uh, one of them are international uh, center and uh, there are 3 million PIDs uh, now ha have been uh, uh, registered. <laughs> So now let's to a typical case as a um, domain uh, repos uh, repository and um, National Space Science Data Center actively applies uh, PIDs in scientific data management. And now let me give a brief introduction to NSSDC. NSSDC is the domain um, data repository for space science. The areas cover, um, covered including the space physics, the space uh, astronomy, the lunar and the planetary, and uh, um, space in, uh, engineering and uh, space application. Um, the NSDC, um, the um, pre, <laughs> predecessor of NSSDC is the CSSDC, uh, namely Chinese Space Science Data Center. It was um, built in the former ICSUD and uh, WDC framework in 1988 and has served as a regular member of WDS since 2003. And in June the 2019, CSSDC was recognized as a national level uh, space science center by the Ministry of Science and Technology of China. And it was remained as, uh, renamed as uh, NSSDC. Its responsibilities are collecting, integrating, archiving, and sharing space scientific data generated by the space science missions and the research communities in China. And here is the um, workflow of the scientific data management of an SSDC. Four types of PIDs are in, in, embedded in the uh, workflow, um, which are uh, DOI, CSTR, handle, and uh, ORCID. In the face of uh, in, in guesting and uh, um, submit, submitting the um, adequate uh, metadata information and the uh, standardized uh, introduction document is necessary and uh, um, filling the uh, ORC IDs of the data authors is strongly um, recommended and if there are any existing um, PIDs of these uh, data set and uh, they should be uh, submitted too. Then an SSDC will um, assign a unique internal um, identifier for the uh, data set which will be used throughout the full uh, process of the data management and sharing. Um, when the data set is released, um, if um, it hasn't uh, existing uh, PIDs, so the internal identifier will be used as a suffix to generate the full uh, PID name. Um, which will be um, registered via the API uh, interface provided by the service, uh, such as CNKI, DOI, and uh, data PID. So based on the above mentioned three types of PIDs, NSDC have published data and catalogs on some um, data platforms, such as uh, uh, China Science and uh, te Technology Resource Sharing Network and the Data Cloud of uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, NSSDC has est estimated a core uh, metadata standard uh, to, co to cover the elements of these three PIDs uh, kernel information and the metadata needed by uh, these two uh, platforms. And here are the list of the elements of the NSSDC um, core metadata, um, including the uh, this, uh, this set name, the discipline uh, classification, uh, classification, the subject class 
specification, the keywords, the um, description, uh, the service organization name, the mail address, the postcode, the contact number, uh, and uh, the resource generation date, uh, the data resource project, the observation, the instrument, the share plan, the share scope, and the URL, the license, the um, data producer name, ORCID, um, email contact um, number, and uh, so on. Yeah, Miss Hu, sorry, a gentle oh. reminder, you, can, you have one minute to wrap up. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, this is an example of a published uh, data set. We show all the um, ORCIDs of the data authors and clicked on the icon and the researcher's personal page at ORCID will be open. And meanwhile, um, these widely accepted PIDs uh, support the citation of uh, this set. Um, for on future work, our source is that in the terms of domain field, we will try to uh, re register metadata on some um, platform with space or VO and so on. And on the uh, general field, we like to try some ways um, to um, connect it to the data site and the open air and the other um, platform. We hope that our case has been helpful helpful to you and hope you can get some, uh, give some advice and uh, um, uh, give some advice uh, to us. And uh, thanks for listening. If you want to have further communication and please feel free to contact us. And uh, um, uh, that's all, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Hu. And uh, yeah, so I, would like to also briefly also uh, mention that, uh, so I think in the first part of this uh, session, we introduced some more high level general introduction of persistent identifiers. And in this session, we invite those speakers to share about more specific details or practical use in terms of PITS adoption. And we can discuss how those national or regional PITS uh, in collaboration with more international ones in the discussion part. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Hu. Uh, I think now you can stop sharing your screen. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay. appreciate it. Yeah, so next, uh, and also uh, next, uh, we are going to welcome Dr. Song, Dr. Song Sang Guang from KST. Dr. Song, are you there? Oh, yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. You can start it then. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, I'm Dr. Sang Guang Song, who is in charge of research data sharing center in Korea Institute of Science and Technology Information. Begin with, uh, it's my pleasure to participate and introduce Korea Research Data Platform in this workshop. In this talk, I'm gonna introduce Korea Research Data Policy as well as Research Data Platform and its ongoing persistent identifier. Before getting to the point, I wanna brief the KISTI where I affiliated in. KISTI is the only research institute designated by Science and Technology Framework Act for establishing national science and technology infrastructure in Korea. The research part of KISTI consists of three divisions. The first is National Science and Technology Division, to which, uh, and to which to which my centers belong, which as its name suggests, manages data and information of science and technology. The second is supercomputing division, which builds and operates a uh, supercomputing ecosystem in Korea. Lastly, the role of data uh, analysis division is to accommodate an uh, environment optimized for R&D technology commercialization through a data analysis system. Actually, KISTI is composed of more than 500 employees and operates with a budget of uh, 146 million USD dollar per year. Okay, from now on, uh, 
uh, let me get into explaining Korean government strategy regarding uh, research data. This slide gives you the conceptual perspective on the government strategy, titled Strategies for Sharing and Utilizing Research Data, established by the task force team led by the Secretary of Science and ICT in 2017. There are four key uh, themes in this strategy. They are legal system modification, human resource training, infrastructure building, and research community proliferation. Among these four, TST takes part in both uh, supporting legal system modification and uh, building infrastructure for research data sharing and utilization. Regarding the infrastructure, uh, the National Research Data Platform is hierarchically linked with specialized centers in each field, so-called domain-specific uh, research data platform center here, as shown in this figure. Fortunately, uh, in September 2019, the, um, the amendments of the law took effect. So uh, in the role, uh, we, uh, we can find the definition of the research data as follows. The research data is the essential and objective factual data for reproduction of research results obtained through various experiments, observations, surveys, and analysis of uh, national R&D projects. Actually, in this uh, definition, it can be seen that the government limits is target to national R&D projects and emphasize the reproducibility of uh, research reserves. The regulation also includes a data management plan. Uh, many of you already understand what it is EMP is. Uh, EMP is a formal document. It's a very short document that outlines how data are to be handled, but during a research project and after the project is completed. Uh, it is consists of four elements, summary, storing and preservation plan, sharing plan, and at the end of uh, directory information of the project. So, uh, and actually this is in a general process of uh, the application of DMP. Sorry. EMP has been already uh, applied to, I'm sorry. Right. EMP has already applied to 900 uh, roughly pilot projects, among them 298 projects in NRF, National, Re National Research Foundation of Korea, and 11 projects in IITP, Institute of Information Communication Technology Planning and Evaluation. Those two uh, organizations is you know, famous in uh, Korea for you know, project funders. And in addition, uh, 25 government-funded research institutes will uh, apply the DAP process to their internal projects by the end of this year. So, and uh, until now, I'll talk about you know, what the strategy and the, the process related research data policy in Korea. Uh, from now on, I'll tackle the, what the Korea research data platform is. Data, uh, data on is the name of a uh, Korea research data platform has been developed in the meantime by reflecting the needs of researchers, the various uh, field of researchers uh, researchers usually require integrated research data management environment, and uh, they want to convenient and in integrated search for domestic and international research data. Moreover, quite a few researchers want data on to offer secure sharing and collaborative analysis environment. So KST has been developing a uh, Korea research data platform, so-called data on since 2018 according to 
Korean government strategy. Actually, the first version of Dayton has been opened just a few months ago this year, January 2020. Uh, this is the uh, conceptual diagram of Dayton. You can see Dayton in the red dashed box here. Uh, that offers five main services, data preservation, convenient search, analysis environment, statistics, and online community. Uh, below this box, uh, specialized centers for each scientific field described in the strategy uh, description slide are hierarchically linked to uh, the data on. Okay? Of course, IDR, institution, institutional data repository, uh, can be linked to data on. Actually, currently uh, we have uh, more than 10 IDR systems are underway. Moreover, uh, global aggregator, aggregators such as OpenAir uh, in the EU, ARDC in Australia, and IRDB in Japan are linked as well. As told in the previous slide, the Dayton offers several uh, search methods such as facet search, map search, and detail search, and so on. It also supports easy preview of large research data on the fly and the web. Actually, the research data are archived or gypped uh, in a single file with uh, a very huge amount of files. Suppose you can have uh, you know, satellite images. Moreover, online community function is also provided so that users can create a research community that fits their interests, invite colleagues to use data set and analysis environment of data on, and eventually conduct research. As a virtual analysis environment, data on provides web-based workflow environment as you can see here, as well as a virtual machine, and it's recommended uh, its command line interface for research data analysis. Usually, the, this web-based workflow engine is for the you know, novice or basic users, and the command line interface is usually for you know expert users. Uh, it's currently beta; it's not open open to public, but sooner or later we will open to the public. Considering the demand for big data and artificial intelligence recently, deep learning based AI analysis or big data analysis using hardware or Spark is possible on this analysis environment. Additionally, we also provide a semantic relation graph for the search results, as shown in this figure, uh, which is a graph that uh, links various objects such as data sets, researchers, projects, and organization, etc. For these, we uh, also hire, you know, uh, identifiers, but it's not uh, persistent identifiers. It's only for the internal use for now. Uh, actually, uh, we also, however, we also include DUI and ORCID and NTISID optionally uh, for future use. But actually, you have to consider the our uh, system is the first version and it's not matured yet. So, uh, but uh, we're also preparing for uh, embedding or employing the DUI and uh, research ID or ORCID and so on. The other, you know, persistent identifiers. In this uh, IDs, we also uh, employ the NTIS IDs, which is you know, a very, very important in Korea because NTI is a national science and technology information service that has been being developed and operated by KISTI under commission from the government. So the NTIS research ID, NTIS project ID, NTIS organization ID, those kind of IDs almost you know, de facto standard in the government. But uh, recently, a little bit uh, changed 
because of uh, we have a big plan of uh, establishing new product management system. So it will be changed a little bit. That's why we could not, you know, uh, fix the uh, the personal identifier uh, policy in our system data on. Okay, this is summary. Actually, uh, the government strategy regarding research data has been started in 2007. Actually, it's a little bit late compared to the other uh, countries. And uh, we successfully am amend an uh, R&D regulation and it can be affected in 2000, uh, since 2019. And uh, some of the application of DMP has been started successfully at the same time. Korea Research Data Platform, so-called Data On, uh, also successfully launched at January 2020 and started to build research data ecosystem in R&D. Uh, data On has its own uh, internal ID system, like, rather than you know the former persistent identifier. But uh, we actually support that DOI, ORCID, and NTIS ID. Uh, could be registered optionally. Yeah. This is the end of, my, end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Song. Thank you for sharing such a detailed orientation about the development of Korea and the role in terms of supporting data. And I haven't seen questions so far. So uh, how about moving forward? And we can take questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, but now the next speaker, Martin, we unfortunately, he seems missing here. So I would like to invite Dr. Ian Bruno to proceed. Dr. Ian, are you there? I am, yes. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Oh, <laughs> Wasn't quite ready for that though. <laughs> Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> I'm afraid that because we miss Martin, so yeah, we are going to switch a little bit around. So uh, yeah, thank you. So next, um, we are going to invite Ian, Dr. Ian Bruno from Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center to share more about the power of PITS at Cambridge Crystal Crystallographic Data Center. Thanks. It's all yours. Thank, thank you for that introduction. And can you see my slide? Yes. No. <laughs> no, no, you can't. Okay. Yeah, no, I can't. I couldn't. Uh, are okay. you going to share your screen now? Um, let me just try again. Um, I thought I had shared. Okay, okay. I think I know what I need to do. I need to hit that button, and now yeah, you should be seeing perfect. my screen. Yes, and, and the Microsoft Edge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's it. And then hopefully the slides appearing now. Yes, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for the introduction, and to you, Rory, and the other organisations for the opportunity to talk to you about um, the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre and how we use the power of PIDs in what we do. Um, I'd like to start by introducing um, the CCDC. Um, our focus is very much on small molecule crystallography data, but we also develop software that takes advantage of this to apply knowledge that you can derive from that data in a range of contexts. Um, we've been working in this area for more than 50 years now. Um, we're a fully independent institution and not-for-profit company um, and undertake our um, own research as well. But at the core of what we do is the Cambridge Structural Database. And this now contains over 1 million small molecule um, crystal structures that have been determined by researchers around the globe. We receive around 80,000 data sets deposited with us each year, um, and we make those all available for people to freely download. But importantly, we enrich these data sets with metadata and um, aggregate them into a database that allows people to generate and apply new knowledge from the collective body of data that's been contributed by the community. And on this slide, this just shows some of the application areas of the CSD. Um, 
sort of which track back to understanding things about molecular geometries and interactions, how molecules assemble, and then these get applied to help design new drugs, uh, manufacture those drugs, and then in a number of emerging areas as well, um, looking at sort of um, other, other areas of chemistry and materials. And it's our software solutions that enable that application of knowledge. But underpinning all this is essentially the deposited data sets that capture the results of the structure determination experiments, whether they've been taken out in a small instrument, in an instrument in a lab, um, or in a large facility such as Spring 8. And CCDC's aim here is to enable researchers to publish their structures so that they are easily discoverable and reusable by others, or if you like, fair. And similar to one of the earlier slides you've seen, I think we see PIDs as being really important to support the FAIR data principles um, by uh, assigning a globally unique identifier to the data set, you make it findable. Um, uh, you, the, those identifiers can lead you to data and metadata to help you retrieve those from various different resources. They enable references between other resources and repositories and they enable you to provide a citation when the data is reused. So I'd like to start by looking at that area of citation really and identifying the um, people that are involved in this and this is obviously a case where ORCID comes in. So what you're seeing here is a sort of as uh, excerpt from our kind of main deposition web service where people will come to upload their structures. We've got various validation checks that take place and we get the researcher to provide additional metadata as well. But at the very start there, we're trying to encourage researchers to provide their ORCID IDs so that can be associated with the data set. We make sure that those IDs are validated through the ORCID API and then we associate those with the profile that we store for depositors in our system. Now, one of the things we're keen to do is make sure we identify the crystallographer who is associated with the structure. There's often a number of people involved in this um, experiment, but we want to make give credit to the crystallographer. And if we've got their ORCID ID and they've indicated what country they're from, we can do a bit of analysis and see sort of right where people are contributing ORCIDs from around the world. Um, so over the past two years, we find that about 50% of crystallographers um, have deposited data with an ORCID. And these came actually from 95 different countries, which I think is quite impressive. Um, but if you look at a six month period, 85% of crystallographers contributing ORCIDs were from 15 countries. And this is the league table. Now, if we look at number of ORCIDs provides, then China actually leads, but we also have to recognize there that a lot of the data that gets contributed to the CSD is coming from China. So it's probably more reasonable to look at percentages. And we find Italy is quite strong here with 88% of crystallographers providing an ORCID. Uh, Spain, Brazil, Poland, France are, are up, up near the top. Uh, Australia, Japan, Korea, somewhere in the middle, and perhaps where there's um, opportunities for improvement and, 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 and greater uptake are in, is in India and China. I want to move on from people and now start thinking about the data. Um, and if we're wanting to get real reproducibility, ideally you want to capture your derived data, the processed data and the raw data. Now, when it comes to what we store in the CSD, the derived data is required and we strongly encourage processed data to to be provided as well. Um, and that's what we assign a DOI to, a package of the derived data, processed data, and also any validation report that might have been generated when the data was deposited. What we don't store is the raw data, but what we do allow is for researchers to provide a link or an identifier that, that, that links out to that if it is stored elsewhere. And this is a good example of this actually from an um, article in the Bulletin of the Chemical Society of Japan, where the um, researchers have provided a DOI to raw data stored in Zenodo. Um, and actually this shows a little bit how, why the storage issues, because this is a 40 gigabyte data set, the raw data. And if you multiply that over tens of thousands of structures, that creates quite a significant storage um, uh, uh, sort of right requirement so um, which which we're not necessarily able to cope with but other 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 resources might. Um, I want to look a little bit now at um, sort of what happens pre-publication though and, and note that 
although we make use of sort of standard identifiers such as DOIs and ORCIDs, um, our own accession ID is still quite important to us. And I think it's important because actually we started having using this before DOIs were routinely being applied to um, research objects. And it's sort of become um, routine now that when uh, researchers, well, researchers deposit with us, they get a accession ID back and it's become routine that they will reference that in their manuscript. Um, and that helps us sort of associate data and article when articles get published. But better is if the publisher requests this ID when someone submits a manuscript. And that allows though that association to be tracked through the publication cycle. Um, and um, it also allows publishers to provide us with feeds that notify us when an article associated with a data set has been published. And with that, it also enables both parties, the publisher and the repository, to make sure that we've got reciprocal links between data set and article. And this shows an example here from an ACS one, where in the CCDC page there, you've got a DOI linking out to the article and the article has our CCDC ID linking back. Now, when we've got that association, we make sure that we provide that in the metadata that we provide to DataCite when we're minting a DOI to associate with the data. Uh, this shows you on the right hand side here, um, the, the sort of just an example of uh, the, the subset of the metadata that we provide that includes the um, link of the article. Now, this metadata that DataCite stores is um, uh, openly available for others to harvest. And one organization that does do this um, is Open Air, who provide a service called Scott Explorer. And they're doing this uh, as part of a service that, that implements the Scolix framework. Now, I think Scolix has been mentioned a couple of times over the last couple of days. Um, for those that may not be familiar with it, it's a framework that aims to make it easy to as uh, associate and publish links between articles and data came out of a collaborative project that was a working group of the RDA and the WDS. And the aim here was sort of to provide a sort of foundation for common data article linking mechanisms. And one of the specific things it does is define a schema that others can adopt to expose links in a consistent manner. Now, this is an example now of this actually in action. So Elsevier, um, now query the Scholar Explorer API to identify links between articles and data sets that they want to expose through their platforms. And the specific example I've shown here is from their Scopus system. And that now has links um, from the records that they store out to data sets stored at the CCDC. The great thing about this is that CCDC actually didn't have to do anything for these links to be enabled, except originally just make sure that we provided that association of um, data set and article in the first place. So this works thanks to the Scholix framework, Scholix Explorer, and providing links between article and data in data site metadata. Now, not every crystal structure we get is necessarily associated with an article. Um, and um, we provide a means for people to communicate structures that they might not otherwise publish. Um, and this is known as sort of CSD communications. And the idea here is that researchers can get credit for their work and it becomes discoverable uh, as otherwise it might not be found. And um, today the CSD communications account for around 10% of structures published annually, which is actually quite significant as a sort of single source. Um, this shows an example of a researcher in the uh, University of Melbourne um, who, who's, who's done this. Um, but what I kind of wanted to highlight here is that, you know, as well as a data site DOI, which we communicate to the depositor as soon as it's made available so they can um, cite the, um, their, their, their crystal structure, we're also assigning an ISSN, which was felt sort of right, um, desired by the sort of wider community to help track and record citations to CSD communications. I want to look now at um, chemistry um, and how we might want to link our crystallographic data out to other chemistry databases. And I'm going to use as an example here PubChem, which is a resource provided by the National Library of Medicine in the US. And we're going to look at what happens if you do a search for a particular substance, which I haven't tried pronouncing yet, but um, Corey Cavadine. Um, and if you do that, you get this um, sort of, this is the beginning of the sort of results page um, that, that gets displayed at PubChem. And you'll see that it's got an indication that the, the crystal structure of this. 
And that picture is actually coming as a result of links and integrations we have with PubChem. Um, and here we have the DOI for the data set, which if you click link out to, um, you can go through to our page. Now, one of the challenges of sort of creating these links is that the ideal way to intersect different chemical databases is to use a machine representation of the 2D chemical structure. The difficulty here is that you can have different but equivalent ways of representing a chemical structure that do not compare. And down the bottom here is the sort of 2D representation from PubChem and CCDC. It's not just their orientation that they differ in, which doesn't actually matter. It's the sort of conventions that are used to represent that structure. And this is where Inchi comes in. Now, INCHI is the international chemical identifier that was initially developed under the auspices of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry um, and is now overseen by the INCHI Trust. And the aim, one, of, one aim of INCHI is that given equivalent but different representations, you put it through the standard INCHI generator and it will come out with the identical string. And this example is shown here that we can take those two different representations of a structure, come up with a common string. Um, this is obviously great for being able to do that sort of, well, being able to link between different data compilations. Um, it's useful for being able to um, help you find structures. And you can also think about associating an inchy for chemical substances with the sort of physical sample IDs that we heard about earlier on. Um, if you want to know more about inchy, the link to the Trust website is there. And so this hopefully pulls things together. Um, and sort of shows how across sort of like CCDC's activities, we take advantage of various PIDs, whether it be just identifying IM, uh, um, data sets sort of like throughout the publication cycle, um, using them to make sure that we're um, linking between articles and data, allowing other people to harvest that and include it in their systems, and then using more domain specific um, identifiers to link out to a range of different chemical and biological resources. There's room for improvement here though and I think as I was going through putting this presentation together a number of things came up that that, that represent things that we'd um, we'd like to be sort of like improving on. Um, with ORCIDs one of the challenges that it's one person depositing if we want to authenticate the ORCID with the their API we can only do that for that one depositor. It'd be great to find ways to reliably capture the ORCID IDs of other contributors to uh, crystal structures. Um, we're very excited about the sort of opportunities that are out there for identifying research organisations and funders and definitely want to look at what we can do in that area. Um, something we've not really looked at as well is identifying and enabling the results of people using our software and services, um, identifying those, allowing them to be citable and look at how we can actually think about issuing data DOIs pre-publication. So maybe those are used throughout the publication cycle instead of our own accession IDs. That leads on to some general opportunities, I think, to think about how we can streamline um, uh, publisher and repository workflows to do this reliably, looking towards further wider adoption of Scolix for data article linking. Be great to see more resources adopting Inchi, and there's definitely developments in that area that are needed. And just ever more connections between research objects, institutions, and people, such as shown in this PID graph, which Martin, were he here, might have talked about. Um, so that concludes my talk, except just to sort of acknowledge my colleagues, Eric and Susanna, who, who contributed to this, but also the various services um, and working groups and organisations that sort of contribute to the adoption and um, development of PIDs that allow us to exploit the power that, that those have. So thank you to them and thank you to you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. And Ian. I think um, your um, presentation delicately in the, illustrates the delicacy of, you know, PIDs integrating together to support a better information flow and how those can reduce burden. And although, and I also get your feedback about contributors part, I think it's something definitely or PID will strive to make it better. And, oh, so, uh, and Rory, are you ready? Okay, I would like to say because Martin seems couldn't make it to make a live presentation now from data side. So uh, luckily he provided us a 
pre-recorded video, so which we are going to play in a moment. So Rory now is um, looking for how to. Best Sorry, I, I had it. I had it there, and then um, I yeah. wasn't sure if you wanted me to play it yet or not. Do I you want do to? It. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think we can. We do have a couple of questions, but I would like to uh, make them to be answered and discussed in the QA session later. So I think now we can proceed to play the video. Thanks. Okay, Rory, we can start playing. Thank you. Welcome. This is Martin Fenner, Data Sites Technical Director. And today I'm going to talk about Data Set Commons a new service that Datasite launched in August 2020, and that is part of the work the European Commission funded Freya project focusing on building a PIP graph. There is not much time in this presentation to talk in more detail about Freya and the European Open Science Cloud, but I'm happy to answer questions related to this after the presentation. FAIR provides three elements that the project is focusing on. The PIP graph that we will talk about today, the PIP forum for training and outreach related to persistent identifiers, and the PIP commons uh, exploring persistent identifier infrastructure sustainability. PIP graph is all about the connections between resources such as publications, data sets, and software to actors like researchers, research institutions, and funders. And um, the first step we took in the FREA project was to explore what kind of use cases are currently difficult to address with the available infrastructures and how the PIT graph implemented as an infrastructure could improve that. And we spent a lot of time in the initial year in FIA on collecting use cases, prioritizing them. And we came on a list of close to 50 use cases and today I'm walking you through one of them which is highlighted on the slide. As a university administrator, I want to get a list of all data sets and software published by our researchers so I can get a comprehensive view of our research outputs. If possible, can I also get all the data and software cited for these outputs and please also the funders and grants that support these outputs. So a lot that is asked here and at the center, this is about academic institutions sort of getting better visibility on the data sets and software produced at their institution for publications, whether it's book chapters, journal articles, conference proceedings, that problem is mostly solved, but for data sets and software, that is still very hard. After we have decided about the most important user stories we explored with the existing infrastructure provided by Freya partners, including data site, what is possible and what is hard to do with, for example, user stories like the one I just showed. Um, we realized that REST APIs in their current form make it really hard to address some of these questions and we decided to build a technology that drives the PIP graph using GraphQL. That's a widely used and well-supported query language. And we implemented this launching a pre-release version in May 2019 and the final version in May 2020, so this is now a publicly available API for everyone to use. And what you see uh, on the left is a visualization of all the major resource type and their connections in that API using a Jupyter Notebook. So that's what we spent um, 
lot of time with in the last year and a half writing Jupyter notebooks that can use this GraphQL API and provide visual outputs or other outputs like lists of CSV, etc. But this is of course an API and an API is not something that many users are comfortable with and that would probably also include the typical um, university administrator. So what we did then and what Dataset Commons is, is providing a web search interface where everyone that's built on the core of the GraphQL API helping to address the use case that we had identified for the pit graph. And I will spend almost the rest of the presentation walking you through how this could look like. Let's assume the institution we're talking about is Imperial College in London. And the first step, because it's of course all about PITs, is what's the persistent identifier for Imperial College? And for this, we are using the research organization registry service which is built into data set comments. You can search right here. Um, you see that the Peel College gives you lots of sort of almost hits because college is of course a common search term, but you clearly see that um, it's two in the search results. Is the Peel College London we are looking for? You also see that other than the raw identifier, there is lots of other pits. And we can go to the page for Peel College. You see basically what the raw API provides us. Um, some additional information if you look closely, for example, that Imperial College was founded in 1907, and we get this information from the data. If you scroll down on that page, you see all the research outputs that data site comments and the pit graph can associate with Imperial College London. Obviously, this is a subset. So we are not claiming we have comprehensive coverage yet. And that's both because data set comments and GraphQL API are new, but more importantly, because the use of persistent identifiers for organizations is at its very beginning. War is not more than two years old, and all other persistent identifiers for organizations also have are still at an early stage of integrating them into metadata of research outputs. So what you see here is we find 50,000 works. And you see on the left what kind of content that is. And you see also in the donut chart, blue is publications, red is data sets, and orange is collections. And these are the content types we find here. We find that the license information is sparse. And that's, again, partly because this information is not available in a standard way that we can show it, and partly, of course, that not everything has a license, unfortunately, because this is optional metadata. This is a data set that is sort of on top of the list, um, published in 2011 with the data repository Dryad. And what we can do you see this already, there are citation use and downloads. We can have a closer look at this data set and see use and downloads over time and see what is citing the data set. In the case of Dryad, they only publish data sets that are sort of the underlying data for a publication. In this case, uh, we see the publication here. And you can follow the link, you can see the citations of that publication, etc. And you see now on the left side that this is a publication of the Crossref DUI. That's one of the powerful aspects of data set comments. We don't really care where content is registered if it has a DUI, it can be data site, can be Crossref, or it can be any of the other six DOI registration agencies that register scholarly content, and that includes, of course, several Asian registration agencies, um, which is not part of 
data set comments yet, but that's sort of something that we are discussing going forward. You can also see the funding. In this case, it's a different data set, it's a publication. You see the funding information, in this case from cross-site metadata, you can link on funder names if they are sort of highlighted as a link, and that brings you back to the Imperial College, which apparently also provided some funding here, or to any of these funders, um, providing again a strong link between research outputs and funding organizations, um, in this case the other direction. And I will close with this slide, which tells you what you can find in dataset comments and where you can look for this information. So this is the dataset comments about page. As of today, you see that we have all of data site and there is a, a problem with metadata. If you look carefully, we actually are close to 20 million works by now. There is something with probably indexing the registration agency, and that's something that we will be fixing in the coming weeks. You see that from Crossref, we have 8.7 million works, and that's a little less than 10% of all their DOIs, and that's just because we have to import all their metadata, transform them into data sets, metadata format, so that we can provide a single search for all DOIs, which also supports complex searches like funding information that we just saw and citations, etc. For ORCID, we have all the identifiers because it's a live API call to ORCID and we're not storing anything. And for the metadata, we currently have a subset, which is the personal and employment metadata. For RAW, which of course has a much smaller number of records, we have everything put live, nothing stored with data site provided via the API. There is some other source of information. I already mentioned Wikidata. We also integrated on Paywall, which provides download links for open access content on Crossref. And of course, we launched the service a month ago, and I hope that this list will be much longer in 12 months' time, including, of course, other DOI registration agencies. On the bottom, you see three important content types publications, data set, and software, and how much of this content we have, and also how this has changed over time, where you clearly see that the most significant trend going upwards is for software, but that's also the newest entry, and the numbers, if you look carefully at the scales, are also much smaller. So software is up and coming. Publications, this has been, have been around forever data sets, you see an upward trend, but there is also um, a little bit up and down, which is mostly if a new uh, organization joins data site, there are just a lot of UIs in the batch, and that's what you see, for example, in 2015. So the, the slide is to highlight that but everything is in data set comments and that you can go to this page to see where we're going and we hope that we have sort of added much more from Crossref in the next six months. Currently, we have about 35 million records in data set comments and our goal is to hit 50 million before the end of the year. And with this, I finish and hope you have good questions either after this presentation or or later. Hey, thank you, Martin. <laughs> so you couldn't make it, but I, but thank you, Martin, for creating such a pre-recorded -re -pre video and about the interesting um, development using pits to you know build more in terms of margin sharing and interesting stuff. So now, right now on, from now on, we are going to enter the. Uh, discussion wrap up session. So I would like to invite all the speakers to turn on your video if you could, if you got good connections. And also I would like to invite uh, Dr. Aminata to moderate the session. We do have a couple of questions through the chat and please uh, you're welcome to add more. And yeah, Dr. Aminata, all yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Estelle, for this. Uh, and we'll start the questions. We have a few of them in the chat, but if anybody wants to speak also, please raise your hand and then uh, so that we can see you here. And if the time allows, we'll give you uh, the floor. And I see that we have 10 minutes, Estelle, for the questions. Is that true? We have 10 minutes. And I will start with the first question here, which is for Dr. Song. And it's in the chat by Hayashi Kusuhiro. And he wanted to know which area are being explore, expected and explored. And then which areas are promising uh, for, the, for the platform you, you discussed. Can you say a little bit more on that, Dr. Song, please? Yes, okay. Can you hear me? Uh, Firstly, I thank you for, you know, Hayashi Kujihiro for, you know, for your very important question about, you know, case study or pilot project related on data on. Uh, actually, the Korean government policy is focusing on uh, sharing first and then uh, focusing on the utilization of the shared and collected research data. That, uh, but actually, the, the perspective of KISTI, we uh, would like to prepare both of them in a short period. So actually, we, uh, you know that, that the data on is uh, just a, the starting stage of the long way to go. But uh, we also want to prepare the both of the, the cases. So even though the, our data on is the first version, but uh, we find several case studies using data on system. So I can introduce some of them. And uh, yeah, the first one is uh, we uh, actually made a small project and uh, uh, which is about, you know, developing a uh, artificial intelligence model for uh, analyzing biomedical data like, you know, uh, MRI or uh, such kind of image data in order to detect some uh, uh, some kind of effect from them. But actually, I'm not uh, majoring in this field. So anyway, some uh, university professor are in involved in this project, and he developed uh, his own uh, module and uh, on our system. I mean, data on uh, developing system. And second. Uh, Case study is about mm, sensor data analysis. But those kind of data came from a uh, drone system. So uh, the, those kind of data are uploaded our system. Then uh, the researchers are getting to our system and then developing uh, using uh, the facilities that uh, we are providing. And the third is. Uh, uh, you know, they, they recently the AI is most promising and uh, everybody focusing on interesting. So third one is the artificial uh, intelligence model. I mean, the deep learning model uh, for you know, predicting the future uh, weather, like, you know, predicting the rainfall amount, amount uh, using uh, several kind of uh, images, like in you know, radio uh, images or satellite images, and so on. But the scale of this, these three uh, case studies are not quite large. But uh, as the, in the first, you know, milestone, it could be uh, a, a, a successful case study for our data on system. Like this is my, uh, you know, answer for the question. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Song. And uh, we also have one question for Dr. Bruno, uh, also from Hayashi. And then he's asking um, if you are allowed to expand CCDC's established methodology and huge practical experience to the other fields, which area or subject would you like to explore? Thank you for the question. It's a good one. Um, and I, I, I wrote a list of things that I could have answered. Um, 
Uh, I could have talked about having standard file formats. I could have talked about the standard identifiers. I could have talked about the publisher workflows, but I think but I, that encouraged adoption of those standards. But I think the bit that I tease out is the cross community collaboration that underpins all that. So it's scientific unions such as the International Union of Crystallography who are very much involved in sort of like developing the standards, but then promoting them, encouraging publishers to encourage researchers to make their data available using those um, standards and repositories then sort of like accepting those as well. Also important is to have champions within the community who, who, who see the value in doing this um, and, and I think it's 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 if I was to sort of try and extend this broadly more broadly out I think it's looking at what we what what a sort of community has at any one particular point and saying right how can we put this to best use at this particular time to encourage people to do the best they can to get their data out there and then being prepared to build on that and and, and improve as sort of like standards develop and um and, and workflows move on so let's hope that provides a good answer to your question Thank you, uh, Dr. Bruno. I have a question for you as well. For your repository, uh, what what are kind of the the quality checks that you do uh, yeah. prior to publishing the data? So I think there's there's, there's sort of three layers to this. Um, there's there's a service that's been again developed within the community called Checksif, which which is again it's sort of become routine that crystallographers will run their sort of data through that either independently or as part of our deposition processes, um, and that will check the consistency and completeness of the data set and generate various alerts. And some publishers require those alerts, certain alerts of certain levels, to be got rid of. Others are quite happy with the an explanation as to why those alerts might exist. We have to recognize that not every data set is going to be perfect and there are going to be artifacts that have to be explained. The second layer then will vary depending on the journal it's being published in, but it's sort of whatever happens at the peer review and the editorial processes. Um, obviously, if it's a specialist crystallography publication, people are going to pay a lot more attention than perhaps to a more general chemistry publication. But a lot of publishers do have uh, groups or organisations they work with that will sort of look specifically at the crystallography. And then the final layer is what happens at the CCDC once that data set is we know it's going to be published. And what we're looking to do there is make sure that we can get a good chemical interpretation of the data so that it's useful in other contexts. And that adds as another sort of layer of sort of checking if the data can be understood and matched to a chemical structure. Um, I, point that I'd make there is because of the volume of um, structures that are coming through that is something where we are increasingly having to rely on automation um, to sort of like highlight where there might be areas that we need to pay more close attention to. Thank you Dr. Bruno and um, I can see also that there is one question for Dr. Hu uh, about the policies. Dr. Hu would you like to elaborate a little bit more about the policies? you mentioned in the chat. Uh, okay, the policy um, is uh, issued by the main, uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology uh, uh, of China and it's, it is the um, top institution of, uh, in China about the uh, science and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, technology. Um, and uh, there are about uh, 20, 20 uh, national level uh, sci uh, scientific data center um, built by the uh, Ministry of Science and uh, Technology of China. And uh, these uh, 20 uh, data centers should uh, obey the policy um, to um, manage, uh, to um, uh, collecting and uh, um, managing and uh, sharing the uh, scientific data uh, from um, multi disciplines, uh, multi uh, in China, and uh, um, there are uh, some uh, some different level uh, policies such as the uh, uh, Chinese Academy of Science and uh, other. Uh, 
local uh, local government uh, policies about uh, scientific data too, and uh, maybe I can uh, attach the links uh, in the um, chat box and. Um, uh, thank that's you. all. That's all. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Estelle. How how much time do we have more? It's I, we are on the time now. Do we have a few minutes? Yeah, I th yeah. I think it's okay. If, uh, I think it does no harm if we run a couple of minutes. Say within ten, if people still feel they have questions or comments to add, let me just check. Uh, do we have anything in the chat now? Uh, if we have a few minutes, I would like to run yeah. on one question for Dr. Song. I, I wanted Please. personally to know, um, for the DMP, you mentioned some of the key principles uh, in that uh, management uh, principles you mentioned. Thank you for your question about the DMP. Actually, the DMP is, uh, mm, it has been uh, in, uh, in several countries, it's not just for Korean. Actually, DMP is uh, about a short document about data management plan. Usually, a, it has been submitted when we submit a, a project proposal. So it uh, contains about you know, the storaging and sharing and managing plan of research data, which will be uh, produced by a certain project. So, uh, yeah, okay. This is the short uh, you know, uh, answer for your question. Is that okay? It's it's perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you. And the the the, the uh, second question about the data on. Uh, actually, the data on is open to all the researchers in South Korea. And, uh, but you know, some of the part of data on is not for open uh, to the researchers because you know, it's, it's, on, it's still in, the, uh, in a better version, okay? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I could see also Dr. Estelle that you had a question for Dr. Hu. Uh, do we have one or two minutes to explore a little bit on that question? Uh, yeah, I think it's, I'm also, yeah, I think uh, Ms. Hu shared a lot about the, the workflow of ORCID IDs in, in their current workflow. So I appreciate that. I think Rari, you want to add something more as I see from the chat, right? Um, to that? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to make one sort of little extra comment because um, uh, Takwan Song's question was, was really, is there any aggregator for gathering and, and sharing domain specific data in, in China? Um, and I wanted to mention that one of the um, initiatives that has been, or is, it, it, it's kind of been developed and is being developed further um, as, as through WDS. So we have um, a number of WDS members in uh, China um, and uh, they are, they, they, they've basically created kind of a, a WDS China committee effectively and the secretariat of that is um, Professor Zhuang Lei Wang um, who is um, a director of the World Data Center for Renewable Resources and Environment um, at the Institute of uh, Geographic Sciences and Natural uh, Resources Research. So it's the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And of course, a lot of the, the WDS members are, 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 are in China are all connected to the, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, and um, one thing that uh, uh, Professor Wang has, has, has taken on is um, it was kind of noticed that, that you know, that all of um, these members are really from quite different domains. Um, but there's been an issue with trying to sort of um, aggregate the, their data or even uh, really in some, in some cases even use those data in, in an international setting, um, partially because of issues with metadata. Um, and so he took it on himself to sort of develop um, what's known as a, a sort of common clearing house for WDS members in China, and and I, he's he put he's put quite a lot of work in, into that, and and I think he's got something 
that is sort of beyond uh, sort of a, a proof of concept or prototype and something that will be further developed in the future, I'm, I'm sure. But this, this I think, is, is the sort of useful developments that, that, that um, maybe answers a little bit um, uh, Dr. Song's question, but, but not wholly, but because it's only a proportion of, of Chinese uh, da data centers, but, but um, at least sort of the ones that are certified as WDS members, um, so the certified as trustworthy data repositories. Thank you, Rory. And uh, I don't see any other questions, so I think uh, I will I'll stop here and over to you, Dr. Estelle. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation to this Q&A session. Yeah, I want to just say, I generally thank you for all who participate and contribute to this workshop. So, yeah, uh, Rory, I think our slide, um, the the video will be the video recordings will be available later on for about a month, right? Yes, yes. So once the um, once the symposium is finished, they will be placed online and available for approximately one month. So yeah, we will obviously be alerting people as to when those are available. Oh, yeah. So much. I think. Yeah, I think it's time to wave goodbye. So, and thank you for those speakers and moderators. So yeah, have a great day and see you tomorrow on or tonight's symposium as well. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.